I would like to welcome you all to today's translation seminar. And uh, today's seminar is certainly on a very unique topic, uh, at least in, in the 20 some years history of our translation seminar series. Uh, we have heard for years that the translation industry is a growing industry, but somehow we um, have not seen much research done on the translation, in, translation industry. So we are in a we're in for a, a treat today because our speaker is going to talk about the processes and also the agents involved in the translation industry, particularly from the perspective of information economics. And the talk will also touch upon such topics as professional status and remuneration, cost, time, quality, and risk. Our speaker today is Dr. Callum Walker. Uh, Dr. Walker is a lecturer in translation technology and also director of the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Leeds. He has worked as a freelance translator and actually owns his uh, uh, translation business. He said it's, a, it's on a small scale. Um, his research interests um, according to him, addresses uh, address two contrasting fields. I, I personally have uh, come across Dr. Walker's research on translation reception studies. Um, I knew that he conducted experiments um, using eye tracking to study reader reception. Uh, and this line of research resulted in a monograph uh, called an eye tracking study of equival equivalent effect in translation which was published in 2021 by Paul Graf. And also, there's also a uh, co-edited volume on eye tracking and multidisciplinary studies on translation, which was published in 2018 by John Benjamins. His current line of research is on a very different topic that's related to today's talk, is on the translation industry. And with a special focus on project management, pricing, and macroeconomics. And he has already published a book related to this line of research, a textbook published last year called Translation Project and Management. The topic for his talk today is information economics and the procurement of translation services. And now I bring you Dr. Walker. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just get my screen sharing going and then rearrange my Zoom window. Okay, fantastic. So, um, good afternoon or good evening or even good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, so, a big thank you, first of all, to Hong Kong Baptist University for inviting me today. Um, so this talk builds on what is an emerging area of research for me. Um, as just stated in the introduction, um, a lot of my work in the past has been uh, focused on uh, reception studies, but this line of research draws on a lot of my professional experience as a translator and some of the work that I'm still doing in that respect um, with my own business. So um, this talk builds on a very short paper I delivered at the ESD Congress in Oslo last year on agency theory. Um, it's also based very loosely around an article I'm writing on this topic. Um, and then it will touch on other areas that I'm researching further during the course of a research sabbatical next year. So the aim really is to explain what I've done, explain what a little bit about what I'm looking into and some of my hypotheses, I suppose, um, and then point to some areas which I think are deserving of research as well. So I'm going to start with a quotation. There are two rules for success. One, never tell everything you know. So this witty aphorism um, comes from a person called Roger H. Lincoln, who's a fairly humble businessman who, run, who ran a construction company um, in the US. And this is often attributed to him, but I think the reason I wanted to share this is because it speaks to a lot of the points that I will be discussing in this talk. And that really is related to knowledge or information. And as translators, this is the value that we bring to what we do. 
our information and our, and our knowledge. So as an overview of what I'll be covering, um, I'm going to start with a bit of a discussion about some of the trends that we're seeing in the translation industry, some of the challenges um, that we're also seeing in there. Um, then I'm going to look at different procurement models, um, sort of as the basis for what I'll be discussing throughout the talk. And then I'll come to the main focus of information economics and the, the very nature of information as a concept as well. This feeds into agency theory, which is um, sort of my main subset of information economics that interests me. Um, then we link in the role of the LFP and we bring in topics relating to Uberization, platform economy. And then towards the end, I'll be talking a bit about some of the implications of this barriers some of the progress that's been made in the industry and then close, as I said, with some ideas, some food for thought on where next basically. So this diagram is one that I often use with my students just as a, it's admittedly a very oversimplified diagram, but it's just to try and highlight some of the challenges that, or at least the trends that we're seeing in the industry at the moment. Some are longer standing, of course, and some have started to emerge a bit more recently. Um, and this just captures some, but obviously not all of those factors. So on the left hand side, we have the client expectations side of things. Client expectations are changing in lots of different ways. And some of that is precipitated by technological developments. So clients are wanting low cost solutions. They want things fast and they want good quality usually. Of course, these are generalizations. They don't apply in every case, but this is some of the pressures that are being reported through industry reports at the moment. And indeed, when you look at other surveys like the European Language Industry Survey, a lot of vendors are pointing to things like time management as a key stress factor. On the other side of the diagram, we have working conditions. So the roles and workflows that we undertake now are changing and have changed. So if we look at things like post editing, for example, um, post editing has existed for quite a long time, but it's really sort of ramped up in the frequency with which it tends to occur now. Um, and this is changing the way that we interact with our day-to-day -day work. Some of these roles and workflows are then related to things like status. Um, this is obviously a long-standing area of discussion in translation studies, and it's not my intention really to, to go into this too much today. Um, but with status and with some of those changing roles and workflows comes some of the impacts on things like pay and, uh, and the rates that we charge for what we do. And again, things like the European Language Industry Survey pointed to pay and rates as key stress factors. Um, a lot of comments were made about needing additional income, vicious circles relating to tight deadlines, uh, feast or famine type uh, work failure to separate working day from the rest of the day, and so on. And the underlying um, connecting th thread really is technology. Um, again, this is not the only cause of these things, but I think it's one of the main contributing factors, really, the pace of technological change. And again, this is something that translators have said is a key stress factor. So CAT tools are changing, computer-assisted interpreting tools are starting to emerge as well alongside those. Um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention automation, machine translation, and AI. And there's a lot of interest in that at the moment. So I'm not going to focus on that too much today because there's plenty of other people that are better equipped to talk about that than me. Um, but also thinking about collaboration. Um, so the way in which we collaborate with people has changed. Part of this is relating to the different workflows and roles that we undertake, but also it's relating to the different forms and styles of CAT tools that we now work with. And then we're pushing even to the realm of the platform economy, economy sorry, and Uberization, which is again changing the way that we work for some of the market. Again, these are generalizations. They don't apply to everyone across the board. They don't apply to all clients, to all translators, to all working conditions. But these are things that are starting to come out of industry-wide surveys. So in terms of the procurement models, then, there are two, generally speaking, as an oversimplification, there are two main procurement models. So the direct client model um, is probably the simplest of all. Um, it's where the client interacts directly with the freelance translator, who I'm 
Bitcoin vendor in this particular case. And um, now in a very sort of generalized form, vendors don't like these quite as much. Sorry, yeah, it's the right way around. Vendors do like these more positively than other forms of models for the simple reason that they have that direct relationship and connection with the client. So they're able to build trust, build a relationship, and then they're also usually able to earn more money from those kinds of relationships as well. So certain surveys, the, the, the surveys that are quoted up here from the Italian and Belgian translators associations, they tend to say that about 35% of their respondents' um, income comes through this channel, sort of direct client interactions. On the client side, however, um, it tends to be slightly less desirable for some clients, not all, but some clients, often because they don't necessarily have the expertise on their side to feel confident in recruiting translators directly and then to manage the subsequent interaction. The second main type of procurement model is the LSP mediated model, where you inter interpose an LSP between that client and the vendor. This is the more common source of work for a lot of translators. Um, and this pie chart here comes from the recent RWS Technology Insights survey. Um, it says that 40% of respondents get most of their work from LSPs, 38% get, get their work from a mixture of LSPs and end clients, and only 22% follow this dyadic direct client model. So clients tend to view these slightly more positively um, in a lot of cases because it means that they can transfer that risk onto another party and they recognize that they potentially lack the knowledge to undertake the work themselves and to manage that project themselves. So they're passing that on to another party. Now, there are pros and cons to LSP work for vendors. On the one hand, the volume of work is one of the benefits in that LSPs invest an awful lot of money in marketing. Vendors can't do that, or at least they don't do that in quite the same way. Um, so in terms of continuity of work, the LSP model is quite beneficial. The downside for a lot of vendors is that LSPs pay less than the direct client model. The thing to point out more generally, of course, is that there are different segments within the market as well. So the placement of the translator, whether that's in the premium or the bulk or even the sort of middle market, will often dictate the balance between direct client type work and LSP mediated work. The thing is, though, this is an oversimplification. So if we look at the picture of the, the client here, um, outsourcing has become and in many ways has always been quite a complex venture involving lots of different parties. So if we look at the LSP type model, for instance, you don't just have the LSP, but you also have different entities within the LSP. So there might be in-house translators or project managers, different employees that specialize in DTP work, and then the owners that manage that company in different ways. Vendors, of course, LSPs have huge databases quite a lot of the time of different vendors. And for any given project, there may be lots of vendors working on that project. LSPs also sometimes subcontract work to other LSPs who in turn have their own database of vendors. And also on the supply side, you have software companies. And while they're not directly involved in the production itself, they interact with the LSPs, they interact with the vendors, and they facilitate that process in lots of different ways, which sort of harks back to that changing landscape diagram that I had before, especially when we think about cloud cap tools. The other thing to bear in mind at the other side of this diagram is that the client isn't necessarily the person that uses the translation. So just because the client has procured it, it doesn't mean that they are the end user. So if we look, for example, at a website localization project, the client might be selling something quite mundane, like, I don't know, pens, let's say, but they need a website so they can sell their product in lots of different locales. So the client uses the website to a degree, but it's actually often the end users that make more use of it for its intended purpose. 
And then, of course, you've got to remember that there is there are other software developers involved that, for instance, manage the software that supports the website or the hosting software and hardware. And they, of course, interact with all these parties. So the vendors interact with them because they're translating that material. The cat tool developers are interacting with them because they support those kinds of files and so on. It's also important to remember that sometimes these roles are blurred. So RW, RWS is a very good example. They recently bought SPL, for example. They're both an LSP and a tech company, a cat tool developer, alongside lots of other tech-related ventures. The other thing is outside the direct supply chain as well, there are other influential parties. And this is something that's mentioned by Donald De Palma in uh, a chapter in one of the Routledge handbooks. Can't remember which one off the top of my head. Globalization one, I think. So you, so you have investors, they have their own interests and stakes at various points in this process, both for the client, for the LSP. You have industry associations that advocate for freelancers or for LSPs or different bodies entirely. And then you also have us in academia and the training institutions where we have a certain amount of influence over the vendors and those that go into work in LSPs. So while those aren't directly involved in the supply chain, this is part of the whole ecosystem that makes up the industry. But even this is still a bit of an oversimplification because nowadays we would also probably add into this platforms, which I've sort of indicated here with this fuzzy oval. Um, so while the platform economy isn't the direct focus of my talk, I will come back to this on quite a few times to exemplify a few of the points I'm making, especially in relation to the bulk market. Um, I would, however, add that there are people in much better place to talk about the platform economy than I am. So the name that comes to mind, first of all, is Gokhan Firat, um, University of Surrey. He's written a very good article on this. Um, and actually, I'm borrowing a little bit from that article in places. So these platforms are starting to blur the boundaries even more. Clients can now, through these platforms, have direct access to vendors. LSPs use the platforms in different ways to facilitate their workflows. Tech developers are integrating their solutions into these platforms. Um, and indeed, cited in uh, Firat's article, there's a study on the state of the linguist supply chain. And from that study, 89% of respondents said that they used some sort of platform in their translation work. And while we might immediately think of uh, translation platforms like SmartCap, which I will be talking about shortly, um, even vendor platforms like XTRF and PluNet are exactly these types of platforms. And LSPs have actually been operating, I would argue, in a platform economy style way for a number of years. So this brings me, after that context there, to information economics. So information economics is a branch of microeconomics, and a lot of microeconomics focuses on things like supply and demand, pricing. It focuses on the behavior of consumers, the behavior of firms, and the decisions they make to buy or sell particular products or services. But as the name suggests, it's within a specific industry or segment, and it's micro, and it tends to ignore or largely disregard wider cross-industry or supranational economic elements, which would then be macroeconomics. So there's a real focus on the value and circulation of information, because information, whether it's present or absent or partially present, affects our decision making as consumers, but also as suppliers. So there are links to things like game theory, which is largely about things like strategic decision-making, cooperation, and there are links to contract theory, so the ways that contracts are designed um, and how they're enforced. And economists have realized that actually the, the sort of more traditional approaches to economics, where in the past they have assumed what's called perfect information, so everybody knows everything, let's say, were not really adequate to reflect the complex reality of real-world relationships. This quote at the bottom highlights that. So the recognition that information is imperfect, not everyone knows everything about what they're doing, that obtaining information can be costly, and that there are important asymmetries of information, and that the extent of information asymmetries is affected by actions of firms and individuals. 
as a profound implications for the wisdom inherited from the past and has provided explanations of economic and social phenomena that otherwise would be hard to understand. So this brings us to the concept of information. Information economics is obviously based around the concept of information, and it treats information as, in a sense, a tradable commodity. So as per this quote, information is fundamentally different from other commodities, however, but each piece of information is different from others. A piece of information cannot be purchased like a chair. An individual can look at a chair, can ascertain its properties before purchasing it. And then I'd like to just turn briefly to Kieran Dunn's article called The Industrialization of Translation, which if you haven't read, I strongly recommend reading because I think he exemplifies this situation very well in that article. So he says, first of all, that quality is an intrinsic characteristic, property or attribute that influences the ability of a product to meet a buyer's requirements, for their identified needs, and expectations, their unidentified needs. And the outsourcing of translation, this is the second quotation, magnifies these problems because translation is both a product something, you know, the file you deliver, but also a service, the, the process, if you like. And perceptions of quality are shaped by both tangible and intangible characteristics and by the subjective assessment of those characteristics. So he then goes on to talk about the characteristics that then shape buyer perceptions. And these are search qualities. So these are attributes that buyers can inspect and evaluate before they buy something. So like in the chair example, you can look at the chair and decide whether it meets your criteria. So search qualities are usually associated with tangible products. Experience qualities are attributes that buyers can evaluate only after they have bought something. So um, the example that Dunn gives, which is from this article by Nelson, is about buying canned tuna, the fish. Um, so it, you would have to buy multiple different brands of tuna to consume and then be able to compare them. And then the third one is credence qualities. So these are attributes that buyers cannot evaluate even after purchase or consumption because they lack the knowledge or capacity to do so. Hence the term credence to do with creed, belief, thinking, um, faith almost. So as Dunn then says, a translation cannot be touched, seen, or evaluated prior to purchase. And this lack of knowledge is a major factor in many clients' decision to outsource the work in the first place. Buyers of outsourced translation generally lack a fully informed basis on which to make purchasing decision decisions, that should be. Thus, and this is the important bit, buyers of translation are essentially buying a promise. And this has very important implications for us when we start to think about how information affects economic agents' decisions to buy or not to buy. So I'll apologize for the long quotations here, but um, we're nearly through some of these theoretical quotations, um, but I just don't think I could have expressed this more succinctly myself. But I think it cuts to the core of what we do. So think about the parallels as I go through this in parts. So, First part, if the seller of information tells, right, let's, let's it be known, the information that he wishes to sell to the buyer before the buyer has bought it, there is no reason that the individual will pay for it. And while an individual may repeatedly buy, say, the same product from some store, each piece of information, by definition, has to be different from other pieces of information, otherwise it's not new information the buyer already knows the information. So as translators, our profession is characterized to a large degree by the fact that our stock in trade is our intrinsic, intangible, and somewhat abstract know-how and know what, in a sense. We trade, in a sense, in information, which is then sort of manifested in textual and other forms, I would argue. We interpret information and re-embody it in some form or another that's different, i.e. new, relative to the original form. And this is why knowledge or lack of knowledge 
of specific information plays such an influential role in translation. So whenever we produce a translation, it's always new. If it were already known, like the if the translation already existed and we didn't have to apply our knowledge to create a new translation, then why would anyone buy from us? Um, so th there are some interesting questions here, by the way, when you think about things like translation memories and even machine translation, which are based on corpora to a certain degree, um, especially when you think about the question of new information. But I would still argue that um, that is not necessarily repeating old information when it's then being repurposed in a new context. So that's something that's perhaps open to debate. Moving on to the second quotation then. In this sense, markets for information are inherently characterized by imperfections of information concerning what is being purchased. And mechanisms like reputation are central. The information issues are in, intertwined with the production and sale of tra traditional commodities. In traditional economics, prices convey all the relevant information. Prices convey information other than that about scarcity. So producers and consumers realize that their actions convey information and that this then affects actions. So what this is basically saying is when information levels differ, that is when our ability to trade in our know-how, our information, makes us valuable. The so reputation and trust start to play a very important role in those relationships I mentioned earlier. Prices tell some of the story, of course, and there are then distinctions between the bulk and the premium ends of the market. But it's also important to think that actions on the part of economic agents can then convey information um, and that the information that is or is not conveyed, i.e. things that are left out about yourself and the way you present yourself, for instance, that can influence action. So that's a little bit on the nature of information. And this now leads us on to um, agency theory itself. So this then is a subfield of information economics and looks in particular at how different forms of information influence power dynamics in contractual or quasi-contractual relationships. So it focuses on situations where cooperating parties have different goals and different division of labor. And one party, or the principal, to so the buyer effectively, delegates work to another, the agent, the seller, the person who, who performs that work. And this is the very basis of the outsourcing model. The principal assigns work to an agent, and the reason for this, as noted in that quote from Friedson there, is that the recipients of expert services are not themselves adequately knowledgeable to solve the problem or to assess the service required. So contractual relationships between different economic agents bring both benefits and challenges to all parties involved. And agency theory as a framework focuses on quite a number of problems, but there are two problems that keep coming to the fore and how these can be solved via contracts and different forms of incentives. So one of them is to do with the question of economic self-interest and opportunism. Um, and I want to stress here that self-interest is not the same as being selfish, incidentally. Um, and then the second one is to do with the fact that the principal, the buyer of translation in our case, can find it difficult to verify what the agent is actually doing. And this is related to risk aversion. They want to try and mitigate or reduce risk down to minimal levels. So when principals then delegate authority to agents to do things, there are issues of trust and there has to be some sort of incentives or monitoring systems to ensure that what's promised is actually being done. And this I will come back to in a short while. So agency theory, um, before, before we go into this any further, I'd just like to dwell briefly on mentions of agency theory or components within it um, that have already appeared in translation studies literature. Um, so Andy Chan is a notable name among these. He wrote a number of articles uh, relating to profession, professionalization, I suppose, and certification, in particular with reference to asymmetric information and adverse selection, which are concepts I'll come back to shortly. Um, and the related topic of signaling. So how do we sort of report our um, 
our abilities to buyers, let's say in very simple terms. Um, Anthony Pym and colleagues in their report on the, uh, the state of the profession in the European Union picked up on a number of threads from this related to information asymmetry, adverse selection and moral hazard, which again I'll come back to in a little while. Um, there's also a brief mention in an article there by Anthony Pym, David Orego Carmona and Esther Torre Simon. Um, and again, there was a discussion in, in those pieces about signaling as a potential solution, but also raising in turn some problems um, as a potential solution to the information asymmetry problem. Um, but as I didn't explain very well just now, um, signaling comes with its own problems, I suppose. Christina Abdallah is um, particularly worthy of note as she's probably paid um, more attention than others to the holistic notion of agency theory um, and sort of seen it as a full complement of uh, components, if you like. Um, so she was very focused on the consequences of delegating authority um, and owned in, owned in rather on dyadic relationships between the translator and the translation company, and then between the translator and the reader, which is more of a sort of implied principal um, agent relationship. So her focus was very much on agency and powerlessness, tied in notions of income, esteem, engagement, and what she called exit. So getting out of those kinds of relationships in very simple terms, I suppose. Um, just briefly, Kaiser Koskinen also picked up on similar threads talking about translated agency and willingness and ability to act. Kieran Dunn, I've already spoken about, so he draws a lot on information asymmetry, buyer perceptions and signaling and also screening. Um, so how buyers decide how they make their decisions and screen between different options. Quite an interesting recent art article by Pat Cadwell, Sharon O'Brien, and Carlos Teixeira um, tries to turn away slightly from the human factors alone. Um, and they draw quite a lot on Mabel Lohan's treatment of agency um, in, as an article relating to the mango of practice. Um, so they're very much focused on the material agent as opposed to the human agent. Um, so it's quite an interesting take on this, but it does move away slightly from um, certainly from my interest in this area. And then finally, um, myself, I've just touched on agency theory briefly in the final chapter of my book on translation project management, but this is more of a sort of introductory overview. And there may be others that I've missed too, and I'm, indeed I welcome any comments afterwards if anyone knows of any that I've missed, um, and apologies to those authors if I have. So collectively, all of these are picked up on different components, um, Christina Abdal has probably been the most comprehensive in, in looking at all the aspects of agency theory, um, but there is more to agency theory and collectively it's quite a powerful conceptual toolkit for empirical investigation, so this is what I'll be coming to just now. So agency theory traditionally is applied to what you might call very corporate kinds of relationships. So the, the archetypal example that's given in a lot of articles on agency theory relates to relationships between company shareholders and company executives. Now, um, what some sociologists and those interested in the sociology of professions, they started to reapply agency theory to professionals instead of the more conventional agents. This has been dubbed the principal professional problem. And this is where I think it starts to become more interesting in the context of translation, because professionals, they argue, don't behave in the same way as the more conventional agents. So as the quotes there indicate, professions are occupations with special prestige, sorry, special power and prestige based on special competence and esoteric bodies of knowledge linked to central needs and values of the social system. Um, and then Sharma goes on to say, that they are exclusive occupational groups applying somewhat abstract knowledge to particular cases. So remember in some ways that this notion of abstract knowledge is linked to what we were talking about in terms of new knowledge, um, sort of reapplying knowledge to different new cases. Um, and that's our know-how, that's what we do. 
and the fact as well that this is esoteric so it's only likely to be understood in terms of know how know what by a small a relatively restricted number of people and this is what makes translators valuable or special compared to regular agents according to their line of thinking so prof professions in very brief terms of course there's a lot more to it than this professions um sharma in particular argues are characterized by selection so training different forms of credentials different forms of licensing um, they're characterized by self-regulation so they have associations disciplinary bodies and different forms of peer monitoring and they're also characterized by trust so reputation plays a very important role and there are also what you might call social network sanctions so um, if you don't play by the rules of that particular professional community, then you risk being sort of um, ousted in a sense, and you can no longer claim, you can no longer be part of that professional community and practice in the same way if you breach that trust in some way. Now, translators have a tricky status, and part of the reason for this, um, this question mark here is because this has obviously been a long line of discussion in translation studies. Now, if you speak to any translator, um, practicing translator, and to most people, we would very strongly argue that we are professionals. And I think that's certainly where everyone wants to be. If you talk to sociologists, however, and the very strict definitions of professions, there are more question marks as to whether translation as a, is, or rather has been fully professionalized, so to speak. Um, and this, I think, is something that um, was mentioned actually in Anthony Pym's uh, and his colleagues report on the profession in the European Union and the different criteria that you would typically apply in order to, to say that um, a particular occupation has professionalized. But that's, that's a different line of inquiry and I'm, I'm not getting into that debate today. But what's interesting for this is that translators do share, in my opinion, a lot of features with what, what you'd see as sort of the professionals that are undisputedly professional. So they have a sense of community. They have a very strong sense of peer checks and balances. And even in very materialistic ways, when we think about things like revision, that is a very obvious, very tangible form of peer checks and balances. If you consistently produce poor standard work, then you risk being sort of ousted from that circle and you'll, you won't be receiving work in future and your reputation will be damaged. But then there's also this question of our calling to serve. And as translators, one of the things that draws most people into the profession is that we want to facilitate communication or intercultural exchange or however you want to describe it. The problem though, is that like a lot of other professionals, there are times where our calling to serve can come into conflict with the imperatives of doing business. So I will come back to that in a little while. So this is to go through just some of the main components of agency theory. Um, so it's been conceptualized as a framework that comprises a number of antecedents, the things that exist and give rise to certain effects or problems. And then there's a certain number of problems, i.e. consequences of those antecedents. So as I've noted before, other translation study scholars have touched upon these in different ways, but as for whether they've all been covered collectively, um, I'm less sure on, and again, I stand to be corrected if so. Part of the reason for this, I think, is because agency theory is, is still a rather muddy concept even in in its own field it's been developed over a number of decades and it draws on snippets of theory from economics sociology and other fields as well so i'm just going to run through these five aspects very quickly now and then i'll go into more depth in them in a moment so the first one is an antecedent so information asymmetry and this is the one with which most people will be most familiar i think and this is that the service provider so in our case, the translator has more information about the service than the buyer. So there's an imbalance in the information that they have. Conversely, it works in both directions, though. The translator also doesn't know much about what the buyer's situation is. The second one is bounded rationality. Um, and this is the idea that actors seldom act 
optimally, they merely act satisfactorily. So they don't always make the best choices. The third is goals incompatibility. Um, so this is the fact that interests between the parties might differ. And this can relate to finances, it can relate to things like deadlines, outcomes, performance criteria, specifications, all sorts. And they're the antecedents. But then the two kind of resulting problems that can occur are adverse selection. And this is the fact that buyers can find it difficult to identify suitable service providers to carry out the work. And then the second is performance ambiguity. So the buyers find it difficult to monitor project performance because they potentially lack the knowledge to do so. Now, um, Bhattacharya and Singh, uh, in this art, the article that's cited there, they, they did a study, an empirical study on outsourcing in a different field. I can't remember which field exactly off the top of my head. And they, they empirically looked at the relationship between these antecedents and the problems. Now, in their model, they didn't have bounded rationality, and this is an insertion of mine into this model. But the others, um, information asymmetry and goals incompatibility, they theorized fed into adverse selection, and then collectively as a whole, they all fed into performance ambiguity as the, those two problems. So that's kind of how it's arranged in, in terms of the way those antecedents and problems are theorized to interact with one another. So go into a little bit more detail on each one. So information asymmetry, as I said, is probably the one you're most familiar with. Um, and it's the one that's been picked up on the most in translation studies literature. So this is all about the fact that um, different economic agents have access to different sources of information. And information, as I noticed earlier, is a valuable commodity. So the professional, in our case, the translator knows how the process is carried out, knows what's involved, knows what he or she can and cannot do, and so on. So as vendors, so yeah, remember this is the translator still, they can use different forms of signaling to report their ability to carry out different work. So they might report that they have an MA in translation, and this helps to signal to a buyer that they are potentially better than another person who doesn't have for instance, an MA in translation study, let's say. And of course, we know that it's not always as simple as that, and that you can get perfectly good translators that don't have formal qualifications. So this is where signaling can be problematic. And another example are certified translators that you have in some jurisdictions to signal that they've undergone certain processes um, and that they are certified. So the problem that we encounter is that lack of information can have a negative effect on prices. So when there is perceived risk in buying a product or service, this basically means that clients are often unwilling, and it shouldn't be this way, but they're sometimes unwilling to pay more for something where they perceive there to be a risk. Um, and this can have an effect on the, the prices, downward pressure, essentially. The other way to then mitigate this problem, but it also creates cost, is that they can invest in what are called information systems. And this is where LSPs come into the picture, which I'll come to very shortly. So lack of information can have effects on prices, and this is one of the most tangible impacts that we see in the industry. So therefore, this is quite a source of inefficiency. The fact that different parties don't know the same information it causes inefficiencies in the way that they interact with one another. So on to bounded rationality. So time pressures and the fact that we have imperfect information on all sides means that clients, LSPs and vendors satisfice. Now this verb um, was, uh, it was coined by Herbert Simon, who's a political scientist and economist in, it was, he coined it in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Economics back in 1978. So that's the quotation there. Decision makers can satisfy either by finding optimum solutions for a simplified world or by finding satisfactory solutions for a more realistic world. So what you can infer from that is the fact that the world is complex, so perfection is not really possible. So what happens is that 
because of time pressures, because of this imperfect information, um, all of these agents tend to satisfy. So that's the portmanteau word that he made out of the verb satisfy and to suffice. So they can try to satisfy most of their needs, but it'll be very difficult to satisfy all of their needs. The other parallel here in relation to bounded rationality and those sort of suboptimal decision making is the fact that we've often commented in translation studies about the fact that translation is often an afterthought in the production process. Um, so Pablo Romero Fresco said it in the context of audiovisual translation. Um, there's some quotations there from Carla Di Franco, who um, said uh, localization service providers and their clients often begin to examine project cost as a reactive endeavor. However, taking a proactive approach, she says, is both easier and far more effective to save time and money. So treating it as an afterthought is not the optimal choice. And actually the optimal choice is to think about it much earlier before the time pressures start to build. Um, Reinhard Scherler also said something very similar there. Digital publishers have learned the hard way about the high cost of localization as an afterthought. So the most advanced of them, i.e. the most advanced, so not all, but some, decided to take localization upstream, close to the design and development teams. So let's move on to goals and compatibility now. Um, this again is, this is probably one of the easier ones to understand in the fact that across the chain, interests and the stakes in different processes will differ between the parties. So again, if we think of the traditional agency theory context, so the very corporate style relations between shareholders and executives, self-interest plays quite a big role here. Um, and that's really about looking after themselves and their probably financial interests, but also other interests as well. Now, in our context, um, Clients might want a low cost solution, a fast turnaround and high quality, whereas the vendor will want to be paid a lot of money, have plenty of time to do it and just deliver a fit for the purpose translation, i.e. one that satisfies the brief. Now, for professionals, which is what I argue and many would agree that translators are, self-interest is less prominent. So Sharma speaks more of principal professional exchanges so where dialogue negotiation plays a more important role when we're talking about professionals instead of the conventional agent. The problem though is that vendors can be in quite a weak position and often this is related to the presence of the LSP um, in the middle of um, what would otherwise be a direct relationship. So David Gemielity wrote um, quite an interesting article which some will quite legitimately take, uh, take issue with rather, in which he argued that um, translators are, he says, unambitious, and he remarked on the poverty cult among translators. And he was basically saying that unlike their business clients, they were reducing their chances for economic prosperity. So in quite a controversial statement at the end, he said, translators might be perceived as more business-like and less poetic, in his words, if they aligned themselves more closely with the expectations, codes, and language of the business world. So what he's saying is that in some ways they're opening themselves up to exploitation. And this is why they often feel undervalued. Again, this is a generalization as well. This is not applicable to all. So here is just something I'd like to bring in very quickly from an emerging line of thought that I'm developing with um, a good colleague of mine, Dr. Joseph Lambert, at Cardiff University. Um, so freelancers sit in a bit of a murky zone from a business perspective um, in that they are business people um, and they, they operate as businesses. But if we take what David Gemiality has said, he argues that they're not business minded. The extent to which you agree with that is down to you. Personally, I, I disagree to a certain extent, but there are some interesting issues that I can foresee here. So the corporate world is often governed by, in very broad terms, corporate social responsibility. And this is a hierarchy of priorities for successful and responsible business management. So it starts at the bottom with economic responsibility. So things about covering costs and making a profit, and it gradually moves up this pyramid to the top 
um, where you reach philanthropy. Um, but the core financial concerns always sit at the bottom. The more modern parallels with this are the ESG drive, so concern for environmental, social and governance standards, for example. Now, freelancers, you might argue, sit in a slightly different realm because they're, they're acting as individuals and they're not corporate entities. So here, just as a sort of preliminary point of inquiry, we started looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is about motivation. And actually, the pyramids share some interesting similarities. So at the bottom, you have physiological needs, um, which covers everything from like clothing, hygiene, food, shelter, sleep, up to safety, which includes health and also financial safety. Belonging, where we start to look at things like friendship, trust, acceptance. So we're starting to bring in the community element here. And then esteem, which is about respect, self-confidence, freedom, and competence. And then at the top, um, self-actualization, which is about development of skills, talents, pursuing goals, enjoying what you do. And the theory is that on this hierarchy of needs, each stage needs to be fulfilled before you move up the pyramid. Not as simple as that, and this is one of the criticisms of this particular model, but it's an interesting starting point. But again, there's a focus on finances towards the bottom before you then move up to more aspirational needs at the top. Um, so what we're interested in, myself and Joseph Lambert, is the parallels, but also the incompatibilities between these needs in the corporate and the individual spheres, and also these two different worlds and mindsets in a certain way. Um, so a bit of a working hypothesis of mine, I have no empirical data to back this up, and this is something I do want to look into, is that actually the further along the supply chain you get, the more these sort of responsibilities and needs become squeezed. Um, as I say, that's a hypothesis, and I, I can't back that up with data yet, but it's something that has come to mind when we were working on this. So that's basically the idea of goals and compatibility, the fact that goals will differ for different parties along the chain for different reasons. And then trying to make them compatible is where tensions can arise. Then we move into the problems. Uh, so the first of which is adverse selection. Um, so this is another aspect that's been touched on quite a lot in translation li studies literature before. And it basically boils down to that first quote. To a novice buyer, all the suppliers look alike because uh, since all of them will likely claim superior expertise, they will all find ways of saying that they're most, the most amazing translator in the world, basically. The many references to this concept in translation studies and elsewhere refer to this famous paper by George Akerlof on the market for lemons, which is in very, very brief terms about the fact that Good cars and bad cars exist, but the fact is because um, buyers have imperfect information, they don't know enough about the cars themselves and to make an informed choice, there's a risk of adverse selection. So a risk of picking the wrong one in very, very simple terms. Now, coming back to the translation context, what good vendors do, good in inverted commas, is issue signals to try and establish the quality of their products or services to try and then distinguish themselves from bad vendors. And this again comes from Anti Pim and colleagues in their report. The problem as, you, as they then go on to note is that signals can be easy to fake. So it's then a question of deciding not which vendor is good or bad, but actually which signal is good or bad. So this is where we then come to questions of screening, which is what and Dunn wrote about in his article, looking for certain traits that seem appealing or relevant. But the problem is if you don't have knowledge of translation as a practice, information asymmetry, how does a buyer know which traits matter? So if you wanted to proclaim to your, uh, to your potential buyer, I have a master's degree from a European Masters in Translation Framework University, and they have no idea what that means, does that really help to elevate your status in their eyes, apart from the fact that it potentially sounds fancy? So this is where screening comes in, where it comes into conflict, I suppose, with signaling and information problems start to abound. The problem then is, 
if all the vendors start to look alike and they are unable to distinguish themselves suitably, there's a tendency to gravitate towards lower prices. Of course, risk goes up in that situation. But if the cost is lower, then that higher risk might be acceptable. They might indeed end up with a bargain. So I usually use a few examples here with my students, which they quite like talking about. Um, and the questions in some ways start to become, what does a client think makes a good translator? But also then what does a vendor think that a client thinks makes a good translator? And what you actually start to see is some translators, especially towards the lower end of the market, effectively playing the game to try and predict what will appeal to clients in the right way. So these bullet points here are just taken from the taglines on um, ProZ or Pros, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So these just appear under their name, meticulous and diligent, translating the ideas behind the word, commitment to quality, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really mean anything. And these are just platitudes that you would expect to see in, in simple terms. Then when you look to actual profiles, and for the record, I don't know these translators. They are just random people I picked up, um, and they could well be fantastic translators. I'll just add that caveat here. Um, you start to see things like bilingualism or trilingualism here being touted as equivalent to being a good translator. And again, that's not to say that being bilingual means you cannot be a good translator. It's just that in a lot of cases, they're not synonymous. You then have these sort of quasi certifications, this Pro Z Certified Pro badge, um, which to the uninitiated onlooker makes them seem like a good translator. They, they have a badge of honor, but they don't really know how they burnt it or what it means. And then this one, um, my students always have an interesting perspective on this one because Cambridge University is obviously one of the best universities in the world in lots of different domains but it doesn't teach a specialized course on translation. It does it as part of undergraduate translation programs, of course, sorry, undergraduate language programs, but it doesn't have a dedicated translation program. So here, what this person is very cleverly doing is playing up the fact that they are Cambridge educated and relying on the fact that the translator doesn't know, sorry, the buyer doesn't know that Cambridge is not actually a typical venue for translator training. Again, I'll stress this person could well be a fantastic translator, but he or she is playing is playing the game, essentially, to say, look at me, here's my background, and this is something I'm signaling to you as a mark of excellence. So this is them reflecting on what they believe will appeal to a client. So then we come to the final problem, performance ambiguity. So how does a non-expert judge the quality of a translation? I mean, how do we even judge quality? Um, even experts within translation studies don't really agree on this in, in simple terms and objective measures of quality are not something we can really speak about. However, what a lot of clients do is they will look at formatting and appearance. And this is something, again, I say to my students, um, it shouldn't matter, but actually the, the presentation of your work is very important because it's one of the first impressions you will make on your client. Sometimes they'll machine translate it back into whichever language to see if it kind of looks the same, which as we know, is problematic. But in a lot of cases, they don't check it at all because they can't. So there's a huge amount of trust placed in the agent. Um, so as this quote from, it, it's quoted in Kieran Dunn's article, when prospective buyers can't experience the projects in advance, they're asked to buy what are essentially promises. And I said this right at the start. They are promises of satisfaction. So if clients have no firm basis on which to evaluate quality prior to purchase or even after purchase, then it follows that they have no firm basis on which to evaluate value. And this is where the, in those direct client relationships, um, translators can play a very important role in helping clients to understand the value that they bring to this. In the LSP mediated situations, this becomes more problematic. So then looking back at um, adverse selection, I suppose, even successful recruitment of a good vendor, in inverted commas, does not equal good quality. The moral hazard 
can play a role. So people shirk their duties sometimes. Sometimes it's conscious, but sometimes it occurs because other things happen in their life. Something comes up and then they have to rush. Um, so even if you manage to recruit somebody successfully that you have a lot of faith in and that they're the right person for the job, it still doesn't mean the performance is going to be as expected. What's interesting, though, is um, these two points at the bottom. So again, these are from Kieran Dunn's excellent article. So this is from a translator or is it a translation project manager? I, I don't recall, but he says, we translate hundreds of thousands of words every day, probably a project manager, for clients around the world. And once those projects are handed back, that's often the last we see of them. And then Kieran Dunn goes on, Anecdotal evidence and the scant treatment of this topic in the literature strongly suggest that the throw it over the wall approach, I love that expression, predominates in the industry. And this, I think, it, it, this really helps to drive home why I think information economics is a really interesting field to look at because, as Kieran Dunn says there, there's not a lot of evidence on this, but it seems to be quite common. Um, how much do clients actually look at translations when they receive them? Um, how do they check them? So those are the antecedents and the problems. And this is often where outside of those dyadic relationships, the LSP steps in. The so agency theory holds that when principals cannot monitor something themselves, third party institutions, as, it, as they're called, will arise to fill the gap and to facilitate economic exchanges. Now, this is a type of agency cost, and the aim is to reduce information asymmetry. It increases the cost, it reduces the risk for the buyer, but what it does do is it brings in new and sometimes conflicting goals. So the LSP is a bit of an interesting, um, an interesting entity here, because I would argue it sits in a dual role. So, it's a, I would say, a fairly conventional agent to the client or principal, but then in turn it is a principal to the end vendor, so the freelance translator. But at the same time, it's acting as an information system to the underlying principal professional relationship that is implied between the client and the vendor. So LSPs are in some ways more of an agent in the pure sense. They sit slightly closer to the business world. They potentially, not in all cases, they have greater opportunities to exploit tensions like vendor goodwill, the sense of duty and service, but they still enable the clients to, to feel like their project is being monitored appropriately. So even though LSPs are there to protect the client to a degree, what you'd hope is that these agency costs are actually added on to the base service. But actually what a lot of people are reporting in surveys is that downward pressure is coming from LSPs precisely because this additional service is not being bolted on top of their basic costs. So for the final 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to turn to this case study, which is relating to Uberization. So Uberization relates to the platform economy. Um, so we've all probably heard of companies like Uber, the taxis, um, Just Eat and its very various names around the world, or Takeaway Food, and Airbnb for accommodation. Now, the aim of platform economy type businesses is to put buyers directly in touch with sellers and to cut out that intermediary that often exists. So in a translation context, this is more focusing on the lower end of the market. This is not relating to the upper sort of premium end of the market. The platform economy, as the top, um, top quotation suggests, is, is really about pushing the costs of labor onto the employee. And so to do this, they use labor on demand business models, self-employment, portfolio careers, and zero hours contracts. So, in the translation industry, usually the only requirement to join platforms um, is to have knowledge of two languages, an internet connection, and some sort of device. So we have um, companies like Unbabble, Steps, Steps, which um, I'm reliably told used to describe itself as more Uber than Uber. Um, 
And the way that these work is really to put the buyers in touch with the sellers. So they rely on a sort of cop capitalist approach. Um, so they, um, they control the means of production, they accumulate capital, and they're based around competition. They use online platforms to enable peer-to-peer -peer transactions. They try to cut out intermediaries. They have a large crowd of freelance and precariat workers, which is a term I've seen in one of Josh Morkin's chapters as well, um, also called gig workers. Um, they use a lot of automated systems and ways to try and obviate legal labor regulations, for which many have got into trouble, of course. Um, and then they have reward and rating systems for quality. And then most interestingly, and this is quite pertinent to translation, is the way in which they monetize data from producers and customers. And in our case, that's very much related to things like translation memories, term bases, and how that then feeds into machine translation as well. So these are popping up all over the place in the translation industry to cater for the bottom end of the market. So SmartCat is an interesting case in point. Um, so these three bit boxes at the top, they're lift, if you ignore the bits at the bottom, these little sections here are lifted straight from its website. So it targets clients, so it says you can find translators, the world's largest marketplace of 500,000 plus translators, editors, proofreaders, and agencies. It targets clients and LSPs. So it talks about automation of project management, um, so a lot of um, linguist sourcing and monitoring. But it also targets vendors as well. So one platform to find, find translation jobs. So it's important to remember that LSPs also use these platforms to facilitate and streamline their processes in different ways and also to find vendors. And at the bottom is how they market themselves to their clients. Note these two bold claims here. So 80% reduction in translation costs, 27% less time spent on translations. And this runs wholly counter to the expectation management that many practitioners would advocate for, namely that translation isn't cheap, good translation takes time, and so on. And um, Moreover, it presents it as a very seamless process of so four easy steps. How to translate with SmartCat? It's a snap. And it's presented as essentially a drag and drop ready made solution. So I tested this because I wanted to see how it worked. Um, so I use a very simple sample text that I actually use in my very, very first CAT class of the year with my students. So it's very, very repetitive it's to show them how translation memories work, basically. Um, lots of repetition so you pick the languages um you drop a text in here and then you click translate uh, so you drag and drop press go, go um and then it's done literally in about a second um and this is what comes up you've got a preview option a download option and then it does offer you a professional review now what's quite hidden is this so this is basically saying it's been machine translated um where it says auto translation with a little tick that's the only mention that this is that where it's come from so far but it's already starting to present it as if it's a sort of done deal finished product so if you click preview it shows you the text straight away so it's, for those who use cat tools it looks very much like a cat tool environment that's how it's designed um and indeed, from there, you can click to download it. And the default download option is to download with unconfirmed edits. Um, or you can click get a pro review and a vendor, just a random, well, not a random vendor, but a vendor is presented to you. I've blacked out their, their details for obvious reasons. And there's a fixed cost shown here and a button to hire a translator. And that's it. So it's... This was available to me within about 10 seconds. So this was almost instant um, in terms of producing this. So there's a lot of information asymmetry at play, lots of, um, sorry, very little information on the whole process for me as a buyer here. In terms of bounded rationality, if we assume that I'm in a hurry, this looks like it's finished and ready in seconds, fantastic. But actually, I'm probably not thinking through clearly where this translation has come from or if it actually meets my needs or if, well, we'll come to quality in a moment. 
in terms of goals and compatibility, it's fast and, well, so far, free. As for quality, I don't yet know, but equally, I don't know much about quality as an ignorant buyer. For the vendor, though, they're pretty much, and the option is to cut them out of the loop in, entirely. Um, if I do hire this particular vendor, they seem to have no agency to negotiate with me or even necessarily to decide. Well, I'd assume that they have the ability to say no to the job, but I don't think they have much more beyond that. The result then is that there's a risk of adverse selection. So this vendor, they might be fantastic again, but they might not be the right person for the job if we ignore the fact that that is a ridiculously easy text. Um, but how do I know? All I can see is the price. I can see this little label that says they're a native speaker. To me, as an ignorant buyer, I don't know if that's important or not. And then there's just a button to hire them. And then there's performance ambiguity. So ultimately, this is just empty output at this stage. So how, as I, person who, let's assume, doesn't work with French at all, how can I judge the quality? Even if I then judge, if, if I then hire this translator to revise it, how can I judge whether this person's output is fit for purpose? You can see the problems that start to arise when you bring these platforms into play. If you look at another dimension, you can do a random search for vendors directly. So this was just a search I did for, I think it was English into Turkish. Um, and again, I know nothing about this person. They were just someone that came up on the list. Um, but you have these quasi certifications again. So certified test passed, which looks good. Um, but what does it mean in practice? How hard are these sort of badges to actually achieve? Then we have lots of stats at the bottom, 2.2 million words translated, quite a lot, 100% consumer satisfaction. Now, I would have a few concerns over 86% on-time delivery, but there's also a flip side to this. So remember, information asymmetry works both ways. The vendor might have very good reasons why they didn't deliver on time. Something might have come up in their life and they were late. But often with these platforms, the vendor doesn't have the ability to respond. Um, so these rating systems are often monodirectional. Um, so problems of information asymmetry and adverse selection are already coming to the fore, um, plus performance ambiguity is a, a continuous problem here. And we can, of course, see a price as well. There's no problem there, except maybe it's quite low, but that's beside the point at the moment. But this is also not very nuanced. Um, so translators usually quote different rates depending on the nature of the job. This creates the illusion that it's just a fixed rate. And because of this, it incentivizes competing translators to undercut one another. And this then has a negative impact on that language pair, but also on the industry as a whole. So why does this matter? Why have I picked this little case study? And why does any of what I'm talking about matter to you today uh, or to us as well as translator trainers for many in the audience? Um, so information or lack of information, I would say, is being capitalized on by a lot of these platform companies. Now, logically, from their perspective, it's an opportunity to solve a problem for clients. So why not? Why wouldn't they want to try and provide an easy solution to their translation needs? So there's reduced or no PM costs. There's you know, no expertise required, as I call it, click and collect translation. There's no interaction with the professional, which is obviously a, a very bad thing that we would say as insiders. And there's commoditization. So the problem is that the information asymmetry is very problematic here. The, the know-how and know-what of the vendors is their valuable commodity, but they are their agency to promote that is being reduced. Platforms are risking devaluing that commodity by sharing or even democratizing that process know-how in a sense. Now, it's maybe a noble venture, but it doesn't mean that the solution works in every case. Um, so are they capitalizing on this lack of knowledge and profiting from it? Cynically, perhaps, yes. So the boundaries are being blurred. Traditional landscape is changing. And while there were obviously agency problems and these antecedents in the past, things are changing, which means those two are changing. 
and project management and consultancy used to be the domain of vendors and project managers within LSPs and platforms are changing this. So traditionally, these sorts of projects would be set up by LSPs or by vendors themselves. Platform, platforms now make it possible for clients to do this with no expertise whatsoever, and they can feed directly into your cap tools. You only have to look at things like um, what they called human translation engines in phrase, used to be called Memsource, which feed into Unbabble and Gengo, um, which is sort of directly merging cap tools and these platforms. So to summarize, there are emerging and existing problems really. So false and unclear signaling, there's lots of these quasi certifications being bandied about in this context, tested, certified, all of these things that to all intents and purposes look good, but actually don't inform insiders very much about what, what's actually involved. But to the ignorant buyer, it looks good. Bidding systems, both in terms of time and money, are forcing greater and greater competition. So on ProZ, for example, when you bid on a job, you're asked to provide your best price and your best time. So all that's happening is people are just trying to undercut and squeezing everything downwards. This then creates unrealistic expectations about rates. And then also, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, rating systems are based around client appraisals and are often monodirectional. So there's no kind of right of reply. The so client education is a tricky term in the industry. Um, a lot of translators don't like that term as well. Um, but this is where some of the old models, those, well, not the old models, because they still exist, but the traditional dyadic client freelancer model works very well. They allow us to interact very well with clients, build up relationships, build trust, inform them of the value that we bring to this work. So an interesting question is, could we argue that vendors are part of the information asymmetry problem. So the fact that some translators are signing up to and using these sites, is that any different to undercutting rates? Well, on the other side, non-translators are also signing up to these sites. Remember, you only need a laptop and internet connection and knowledge of two languages. So there's a wider public education issue as well. And I think things like Lynn Boker's recent book on uh, demystifying translation is a really good step in the right direction. Um, but the, this is a whole host of problems here related to what's happening. So clients are reluctant to contact vendors directly in a lot of cases because they lack know-how, because they lack the necessary information. And this is why they sometimes resort to LSPs and now in some cases are resorting to platforms. There's no problem with that, of course, in real terms, in economic terms at least, but it does have a negative impact on working conditions. So Kieran Dunn there, again from the same article, says that quality uncertainty, which is related to performance ambiguity, and information asymmetry drive down prices, benefiting buyers more than sellers. Question. Are LSPs more likely to be guided by self-interest and more likely to take advantage of vendors calling to serve? Perhaps. If you look at figures from the pandemic, some of the biggest LSPs margins remained buoyant while a lot of vendors were struggling to make ends meet. From a recent survey by Inbox Translation, translation agencies are two and a half times more likely to ask translators to lower their rates than direct clients. So education is is a, a, a wider problem to try and redress that information asymmetry. And things like this book, the Translation Getting It Right series, which Chris Durbin wrote and is now um, shared across lots of associations, a really good venture and it's, it's, it's doing some important work. But the problem is that it's hard to get that kind of reach out there. So a lot of this is about dialogue. It's a lot of it's about trust but also educators, which just brings me to the final couple of slides. So what can we do? Well, um, status professionalization and agency lie at the heart of a lot of these issues, the translators. Um, I'm not gonna go into those too much because they've been dealt with a lot elsewhere, but the educators that I've just mentioned are something that Joseph Lambert and I addressed in this recent article. Um, 
and we've said that a lot of these agency problems are connected with more deeply embedded concerns about those points, status, professionalization, agency. So Donald De Palma was the one that spoke of these educators. And we argued in our article that some educators have a more direct influence and some have a more indirect influence to affect change. But ultimately, the, there needs to be greater collaboration and academic institutions and industry associations um, can play an important role here. Um, but I suppose the more general point is that no single educator plays an overarching role. Indeed, if you look to um, what barriers there are and also what progress is being made, um, Anthony Pym quite rightly says that progress as academics can be hard won. So initiatives have run a ground on the rocky shores where industry meets academia, where there is amazingly little trust. Professional associations um, are starting to engage with these things. There was a, a recent um, call for evidence um, which the CIOL, Chartered Institute of Linguists in the United Kingdom, responded to. Um, I'm not going to read the quotation because it's not directly relevant here, but associations are starting to engage with these things as well. So really the general point is, and again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this now because I'm bringing this to a close, that different educators play different roles. And what we argued in that article was that educators contribute directly to clients' wider understanding of what translation is, what it involves, and most importantly, what it's worth. Um, and I think this is where it's very important that we think about what we can do as academics here. Impactful research and translation studies is important. In academia, we have the time, resources, and expertise to conduct studies that a lot of commercial companies might be able to support financially, but lack the inclination, time, expertise to do. Um, translator associations play a very important role in disseminating that information. Um, so Joseph and I, for example, are working on uh, a race and general freelancer translation survey with the Institute of Translation and Interpreting at the moment with an LFP to collect some data on what's going on. Um, so LSPs even can form part of this landscape as educators and start to stand up for um, some of these issues in a more, in a more bro broader sort of context. So really a lot of this can be down to joint publications, surveys, podcasts. We've done podcasts recently together. Um, and invited speakers in both directions, just greater dialogue really, and academia trying to engage better with what's going on in the industry, which is happening more and more, has to be said. So it just boils down to this really for me, rates are still one of the biggest concerns of translators. Um, and to from that survey that I mentioned before by Inbox Translation, that it tends to be ranked highest among those that responded. What's good though, is that there is some sign of pushback. So in the NIMSI report, LSPs have started to push back against this trend. So there's a Swedish LSP that pulled out of contract due to price pressure. Uh, the big word in the UK increased its prices. And then there were strikes and protests in Denmark over a Ministry of Justice contract. So ultimately some professionals are struggling and these perspectives from information economics and agency theory can help to understand what some of the root causes might be. So this brings me to my final slide, which is really just an invitation to think about this in more detail. Now, I said at the start, this is an emerging area for me. Lots of others have touched, in this, touched on this area as well, but I think it's a very useful conceptual framework. And I think it can help us to understand a lot better some of the things that are happening in these relationships within the industry. There are lots of stakeholders involved, and there's four of them that are just indicated on that diagram there. Um, clients are one of the hardest to access, but they're actually one of the ones that I think are most interesting um, and the ones I would most like to speak to among, the, among this landscape. Um, and this is just a snapshot of questions that I think would be interesting to explore further. So, you know, what, what does everyone know about? these situ about the landscape what do they need to know and what do they want to know clients especially where do the pressures lies where where 
Where are their tensions? Where are their compromises? How do buyers pick LSPs or vendors even? How do LSPs pick vendors? What attributes are important? How important is price? And then how do clients actually check performance? And what even does a good translation look like to a client? So with that invitation, um, that brings me to the end of this talk. So I hope it's been insightful and provided some interesting food for thought. And I welcome any questions, comments, or suggestions for my future work. So thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. Uh, this is certainly a very insightful talk. I mean, it really makes me realize that how overly simplified, I mean, you know, my views on the translation industry, and thank you for the illustration, clear illustration on the dynamics, the relationship between different agents. Um, so we are going to take your questions. Uh, we would love to hear your voice or see your face. If you can raise your hands. Uh, alternatively, you can also type in your uh, questions in chat, in the chat box. Let's see whether... I yes. can see some comments there from Chris Durbin, which is excellent to see. We've had some very interesting conversations about this in the past, so it's nice to see further engagement. Thank you, Chris. Um, track back through some of your comments. Just picking up on the point about um, portfolios, Chris, um, that's a really interesting one. And actually uh, something I get asked quite a lot by students is the value of portfolios. And I think I'd agree exactly with you on that, that it's a very effective way to try and sort of better, um, better market what you do and what, what makes you special and the value that you bring to that relationship um, and the Q&A as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, if there's any thoughts anyone has as well, it doesn't have to be now. If anyone comes across anything relevant to this that I've missed, and I admit my sort of brief literature review was was brief, then do please let me know as well, because this is, as I say, it's emerging work, um, and I can't possibly have covered everything yet, so always keen to read more. It's one more okay. chat message coming up, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what exact actions, practices do you recommend translators step ahead in the market and make it to conquer a better position in it? This is a very good question, one that I'm asked a lot again. Um, I think what I was just saying in response to Chris is, uh, Chris's advice there, just a little bit higher in the chat, is a very good one about personal portfolios. Um, so I think the, the very first thing I would always say to my students is never undersell yourself. Um, and that's easier said than done. I'll happily admit that. Um, but the risk is that if you if you start to accept um, rates that are sort of too low, or you start to accept conditions that are not favourable to you, then it sets, sets a very bad precedent, not just for you but for others as well. So to go back to what Chris was saying, portfolios are a fantastic way to showcase what you are capable of, and to show the value that you can bring to a relationship. Um, so specialization is a very important part of that. Um, and I think it's, I think it's starting to be something that most translators do, um, but I think it's not sold enough, certainly to students of translation, that how important the specialization can be, because if you want to profess that you are an expert in what you're doing, then you need to work hard at that specialization to, to make sure you're researching it well. Um, so yeah, specialization or specialization rather, or failures, and just more generally being, this is my experience as well, I think it touches base with what Chris is saying with the Q&A, being open to discussion and proving to the clients through the way in which you interact with them, that you are a trustworthy and capable individual. Um, so I think a lot of my advice there sounds very intangible and unfortunately a lot of it is um but probably the biggest point within that is just to not undersell what you do um i think that was what it boils down to there are some good yeah sorry i was just going to say there are some good training 
there are various events and publications on this as well about sort of how to how to sort of make it as a translator. Some are better than others, I'll accept. Um, but there are quite a lot of things out there that you can try and tap into and you can you can pull little bits from different things to sort of formulate your own response to that question as well, because everyone has different different experience. My experience of getting into the industry all those years ago will be different to someone else's. So talk to people. I guess that's another thing. Talk to lots of people. And Callum, if I uh, may, I, if I can jump in, you know, uh, my understanding of what you were, um, you know, what you cover in your talk, uh, seems to be um, more related to, for example, the relationship between new clients and new vendors. Uh, so mm. you, you you touch upon this, you know, this uh, this issue of trust. I just don't know whether you know in this, you know, that now in the day and age, in this uh, current. Uh, uh, environment, you know, whether this trust and you know, those established relationship between uh, a client and a vendor still counts and how much does it count? I think it's partly down to the the maturity of the relationship in, in the sense what you were saying is is in part correct that a lot of what I'm talking about is at the, at the early stages of a relationship. So when, when a client's first looking, I, I, have a, I have a document, I need to get it translated. So what am I going to do? Am I going to go to an LSP, to a direct vendor or freelancer, or am I going to go, am I going to look at these platforms? Um, so in that case, trust is a problem because it's difficult to trust someone you don't know. Um, but I think... A lot of the best translators out there and the ones, certainly the ones that I've spoken to will say that trust is very important, but obviously it takes a lot of time to build. But a lot of that trust comes from um, consistently delivering on what you promise and consistently delivering the high quality that you have sold to them as being the value that you bring to that transaction. Um, and I think this is where the current climate with the development of these platforms, which they are used, they are quite widely used, which um, has a lot of pros, but also probably quite a lot of cons as well. That is affecting our notion of trust um, and that relationship. I think the best, the best instances of those relationships occur in those dyadic relationships where you have a client who works directly with a translator and they've worked with them for a long time, they have an excellent working relationship and there's complete trust in both directions there. Um, in the sort of LSP mediated model, already that starts to break down a little bit because the client might trust the LSP and the LSP might trust certain vendors, um, but it doesn't mean that that's the perfect solution as well because what I saw when I was working for a lot of LSPs, sort of more in the early days of my work, um, LSPs have preferred vendors. They will often keep going back to the same people because they trust them to do what they want them to do. If those vendors are not available, and often they're not, if they're very good translators, they won't be available, they then have to go with someone else. And so in some respects, in those kinds of situations, trust almost falls by the wayside because they have to find a solution for things. In those dyadic relationships between clients and freelancers, what will quite often happen is if the freelancer is not available, the client will wait. Um, not always, but a lot of the time they will wait because they understand that that particular freelancer knows what I want. They deliver good quality work. I trust them to do so. Therefore, it is worth my time to wait for them. So I, th I think, in short, it really the importance of trust really depends on how the work is sourced through that supply chain and all the different types of models that are now starting to emerge there. But yeah, interesting question. Let's see, I have uh, I have a lot of questions, but I think there's a new chat message coming up here. Um, So Carsten's got a good question there. Um, isn't the profession of translator bound to be extinct in the light of generative AI? Uh, 
I would say no. <laughs> so, and I see you saying that you're playing devil's advocate there. Um, I think there will there will always be a role for translators, um, and I think this again comes down to the value of what we do. So, I think the people that are most at risk from AI and sort of the increasing quality of machine translation are those that ultimately don't offer a great deal more than what machine translation can do. So this again harks back to our that, that the question of information and that what makes us unique, what what brings us hopefully hopefully brings us us success when I can speak properly, is the fact that we can do something that is is esoteric, it's abstract. And it can't be formalized in the same way that machine translation is. So when you ask this question, quite a lot of people will respond that a lot of the more sort of mundane forms of translation, especially where risk is quite low, if there's low reputational risk or people's lives aren't involved in the translation, so you know, non-medical stuff, or there's no legal consequences, it might be that MT reaches a stage where actually it can produce translations that are perfectly adequate. But it's at the other end of the market, and this again is where we're looking more towards the premium end of the market, where my personal impression is MT will not reach that level, at least in the very near future, um, or even the medium term, in my relatively non-expertise opinion. Um, so where translators add their value is is in those relationships. And so the reason why I feel that they won't be going extinct anytime soon, or at least those at the upper end of the market, is because they add something that MT can't do at the moment. I don't think it will be able to do for quite a long time. Um, and this is what we tell our students as well, is that because um, this is a question that comes up all the time, and it's something we do engage with very directly. Um, you have to think about what makes you different to what MT can do. If you're, if the quality of the translations you produce are effectively the same as MT, then yes, your your job could be a risk in future. But if what you bring to that transa transaction, not just in terms of the quality of your translation, but also in terms of all all the knowledge that comes with it, so the consultancy, the trust, the dialogue, the the interaction with the client the whole package that you offer, that's what sets us apart. That's that's my impression at least. Yes, thank you, Anthony. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mention GPT mainly because that's an area that I am still quite fuzzy on. Um, but from what I do understand of it, I think it is that is one of the areas which I think is likely to be more problematic in future. Um, but I will, I will defer my expertise to those that, sorry, I'll defer expertise on this matter to those that actually know more about it. So that's sort of beyond my comfort zone, I think. I do agree. EPT is one of the, the rising issues that we face. Okay, we have a question. So, it's about the term agency. You find the term agency confusing. It's often discussed in translation studies from the perspective of sociology, focusing on different aspects. It tells a different meaning or shared meaning of this term agent and agency in economics and sociology. Okay, so, yes. I agree. <laughs> the term agent agency are used in lots of different contexts. So in economics, um, agent can be used to refer to anybody that kind of does something in an economic context, and that can be consumers, it can be firms. Um, so that's that's the sort of very simple economic side of things. In sociology, um, and this is not strictly my field, um, agency takes on a different meaning in the sense that agency can be to do with power to act or willing to a certain extent willingness to act. Um, now agency theory, 
is a, is a bit of a interesting question because it's more about the way in which people act but in an economic context which is where i think it becomes quite confusing um and i think in the translation studies context we often see agency more in terms of um ability to act in that sort of slightly more sociological sense um in the sense of agency theory I think it's a difficult term to define because it borrows on the notion of economic agents, um, but it takes on a slightly more neutral meaning in the sense that it's, dis it's distinguished from the principal. So the principal is the person that starts the project and wants to, um, to buy a translation, let's say, and the agent is the one that arranges or performs the work for them. So in that sense, agent is used as in quite a neutral way um as just somebody that does something in that particular context that's in some ways why i quite like the development of that by those that work in the sociology of professions when they talk about the principal professional relationship um because i think it starts to <laughs> for want of a better word it gives more agency to the professionals i know that's the not the best way to explain it, but it makes the professionals in that particular variant of the model, it makes them seem like they have a greater stake in what's going on, a greater interest in that sort of community, that sphere. Um, and I don't feel that that's the case in the very traditional meaning of agent in agency theory proper. Um, so I can't speak too much to the sort of pure definition of agency in sociology, but that's that's how I understand it, is that um, a lot of agency in translation studies has focused on, I suppose, questions of power um, and ability to act or willing and willingness to act to a certain degree. I hope that helps. Um, as I say, this is an emerging area, and I think that in itself is a very good question. Um, which I will look into in more detail because I think it's something I do need to clarify myself. Yes, actually, that's a very good point about um, actors and actor network theory. So um, that's what's quite interesting about it, actually. So in actor network theory, um, actors, to my knowledge, as you say, don't have to be human. Um, there's also some interesting parallels here with Maeve Lohan's practice theory applications to translation studies. Um, and I think also the, the other parallel is that article I mentioned by Pat, Pat Cadwell, Sharon O'Brien and Carlos Teixeira, where they're applying agency theory into a sort of non-human um, sphere. So I don't think it's excluded. I don't think sort of non-humans are excluded from agency theory. Um, I think it just tends to focus more on the human element because it's bringing in a slightly sociologically informed um, understanding of how people interact, but also with the connection to economics as well. Interesting points, and I'll make a note of those because I think that certainly for um, the article that I was talking about at the start, I think defining the agency and agent is quite an important term. So thank you. Well, before the next question comes in, I do have a question about professionalism uh, because I could, cannot, you touch upon it a, a little bit in your talk. And also, I still remember seeing that slide, you know, where you put a question mark next to the word professionals. And uh, it reminded me of a earlier study actually done by a former student who was uh, studying the professional, the process of professionalization of interpreters in Taiwan. And it seemed his, if I remember correctly, Joseph Sung and in his uh, model, he um, he concluded that um, interpreters, certainly the professional interpreters uh, certainly has not reached the uh, what you know how we conventionally know, uh, understand about professionalization. And I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about professionalization and mm -hmm. uh, this topic. And then particularly, for example, 
it, the role of uh, in training institutions and also associations. I just don't know whether a, a, U, a, a international association that used to be pretty powerful like IEC, you know, whether mm. in this environment, you know, their influence will be diminished or getting weaker. Interesting questions. So on the professionalization topic, I suppose the reason I put it with a question mark and the reason why it's, it's sort of up for debate and why uh, the colleague you mentioned probably found that it's not um, that, did you say it was interpreting in Taiwan, um, I think was what you said, um, why that probably hasn't reached a sort of professionalized status is is likely because um, of a number of factors. Now, if I remember correctly, um, hopefully Anthony Pym is still around and he might correct me if I misquote him here. I think in the report on the professionalization, uh, sorry, profession, uh, the translation profession in the European Union, um, one of the points that's mentioned is there are certain criteria before you can sort of classify an occupation as a profession. One of them is that there are restrictions on entry into the profession. Um, so in translation, we don't really have many restrictions on entry in the sense that technically anybody can call themselves a translator. You can't necessarily call yourself a certified translator. And I think in Denmark, there's a protected term, um, translator. It's um, spelled the same as in English, but it's got the, the bar through the O, the final O, the name, and that's a protected status. But you can't call yourself that unless you've gone through the relevant process. But in the main, that criterion is not met because anyone can call themselves a translator, um, whether we like that or not. The second one, um, was to do with the role of the associations and associations controlling the conduct of members. Um, so we do have associations, so IEC is a good example of that, um, but also sort of local ones like the Institute of Translation and Interpreting in the UK and others around the world. They control the conduct of their members but not of everyone. And I think that's the other point that um, I think that was the third criterion in from that report is that only members of certain associations can provide those services. So if you think of doctors, for example, like in the UK, you have to be registered with, um, I can't remember the, the name of it now, but you have to be registered with a particular body that says you are authorized to act as a doctor and that's fine. Same with translators, though, we don't have that. We have associations, but we don't have to be registered with an association to practice as a translator. So in the case of all of those criteria, they're not met because it's, it's an unregulated industry in most contexts. I think there are exceptions. Now, the question about interpreting was an interesting one because it, it's often said that certainly conference interpreters have a sort of better status than um than say public service interpreters and then also with uh translators as well but i think it really it really depends on the nature of the country and the jurisdiction as well so there are there are exceptions to these um so that answers the question about professionalization i suppose and um remind me of the second part of your question because you asked a few things in one I should have made a note of them as you were asking. Yeah, I just remember, I, uh, I think a monopoly probably is one of the conditions, if I remember correctly. And I th uh, yeah. I think it can be in that, um, I think I'm right in saying in Hungary, if you want any sort of official translation, it has to be done through a particular government body in Hungary. Um, but that still doesn't mean that Kind of regular translators can't act in that capacity as well. I think there's better regulation of interpreting than there is of translation. Um, interpreting is not my expertise at all, but I seem to think in the UK it is possible to act as an interpreter without any sort of membership of certain bodies, but it's certainly very hard 
Um, there's a National Register of Public Service Interpreters here in the UK, and I'm pretty sure that if you want to stand any chance of being hired to interpret in a courtroom or hospital or anywhere else, they go to, they use those databases. Um, but yeah, interpreting is not so much my field. Um, so I, I think also that that brings to light the other point that there are local idiosyncrasies, but there are also role specific ones. So translators and interpreters work in slightly different ways as well. How about the role of training institutions? That was the other question. Thank That's you. Right. Um, so training institutions, I think the article that I was talking about at the end that I co-authored with Joseph Lambert, um, we speak of training institutions as sort of one of these indirect educators in the sense that we are very tangibly educators because that's what we do when we train. Um, but at the same time, we can't have any direct influence over the market. Um, like we, we don't have the power to influence the market. So our influence is very indirect. And I think really what this comes down to is the way that we teach translators and interpreters in our universities or in other training centers to make sure that, well, in some ways, a lot of the things we were talking about in some of the earlier questions are, um, are passed on to the translators and interpreters of the future and that they understand the value that they bring to these exchanges, the value that they bring to their clients in future. And that actually they've undergone a lot of training to get to the point where they are and that what they produce or being well should be of a much better standard than somebody who has not undergone that training. And I think it's trying to make them aware of this context so everything i've talked about today i talk about with my students and some of them do say to me why are you telling us that, that you know conditions are so bad um for some of us and i said well i i tell them that firstly they're not bad for everyone um this isn't universal um but secondly it's important that you understand what's going on so that you can learn how you want to conduct yourself in this context. Um, so just because others, let's say, are signing up to these platforms, if you're aware of some of the pros and cons of them, they can make informed choices on their own as to whether they want to contribute to that trend or whether they want to say, actually, no, <clears throat> I, I disagree with that. Actually, I'm going to try and focus on this. And I think actually making them aware of the fact that the translation marketplace is not it's not a monolithic entity there are different that sort of subsectors of it right away from the bulk up to the the premium and you know even sort of super premium market so aspirationally with i always try to say to them you know this is what is achievable um and it doesn't come easy as well that's the other thing um and I think it's trying to instill in them the fact that they are, or that by the time they finish their training, they will be sitting among other professionals that have potentially done this for a long time. And they need to understand what it means to be a translator and what they bring to that environment and what makes them special and valuable to the economy. Because translators are incredibly valuable to the economy. Um, so just generally, I think this this whole sphere of research, which then feeds into teaching, is incredibly relevant, um, if nothing else, just to sort of open their eyes to things that um, what I wouldn't want them to go out there doing it when they finish their degree. I would hate for students to go out there thinking that this is a nice, rosy environment and everything is fantastic and it's nice and easy and they'll automatically fall into a very high earning freelance role with lots and lots of clients bombarding them every day and it takes work if you talk to any of the best translators out there it takes a lot of work to get to that stage um so i think a, a healthy dose of realism is what will not only help them to thrive but will also help the profession to survive as well and that rhymes so it must be true
And do you think that, for example, you know what you're teaching at your university? I'm, I'm sure, you know, for example, in one of the slides you you show that uh, actually that was what you taught your students. And it, mm -hmm. whether you know to bring a, a, a dose of real, uh, reality, you know, to to students, you know, uh, probably uh, the translation industry has to be taught this way, right? I mean, usually, um, I, I'm not talking about all institutions, but in 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 a lot of training schools. Uh, the way uh, you know related courses are taught, usually I, I, I'm not saying that they're superficial, but you know usually we talk about you know how do we interact with clients. You know there's like almost you know, there's a set of rules that students can adopt to interact with it, with clients. But in a way, you know after hearing your talk, you seem that there's some a lot of underlying um, understanding mm -hmm. we should we should have. So I just don't know you know how would you you know, whether the curriculum for translators should be should be changed. And I, I also have I a question about research, but yeah, please. I think the nice thing about this, what I've spoken about today is that it feeds into lots of different aspects of um, translator training, and it feeds into a lot of aspects of things that a lot of institutions are already doing, but they don't necessarily focus on this. So, for example, when I teach about this, it's built into, um, so I teach computer assisted translation. So obviously things to do with um, the impact of technology on the way we work, um, things to do with even like rates when it comes to matches, when it comes to post editing, um, things like that, that all comes into um, my sort of cat classes. Um, I teach some of this in lectures on ethics. Um, so a lot of this is that sort of feeds slightly more into the status, professionalization, the, the general community side of things as well, and good practices, bad practices, or questionable practices, maybe. Um, so I think it's that a lot of institutions have very good forums to, to touch on a lot of this. And a lot of them are probably already doing some of this in different ways. I think um, I think one of the best ways that I see a lot of this coming to the fore is when we do our simulated translation bureaus. So we do three of these over the year on the applied translation program that I manage. Um, and I think it's it's fine doing the classes before that, so specialised translation, the CAT classes, when they're learning how to do things. And then when you throw them into a sort of simulated project, this is where those interactions between the clients, so myself and my colleague, we act as ignorant clients and we ask stupid questions and make their lives difficult in lots of different ways. The project managers that are from the students, they see things in different ways, so they have to deal with vendors that are not communicating properly or they're demanding higher rates or whatever. And then they're balancing it against things that I'm saying as a client. So it's when they get thrown into those simulated environments that they start to see, okay, actually something we've done in a very safe classroom environment where we're talking about, you know, how do you use Trados or what are some of the ethical issues that are related to this particular practice? They then see it start to be applied in a practical setting. So I think practice is one of the best ways to integrate this. So I, I wouldn't deliver this talk, for example. <laughs> I think it's far too dense to build into a class. Um, but snippets of it, I dot this around all over the place on my teaching. And I think it, I'd like to think it has a beneficial effect. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Uh, I do have another question, but I think there's a message in the chat box. Uh, Are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so consumers can generally identify an incompetent translator very quickly. Yes. Incompetent translator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think this is, again, um, one of the issues is that I think also the setting there changes as well. It depends how much the direct consumer is interacting with the incompetent translator or interpreter. Sorry, in that case. Um, so yes, they would probably spot that in interpreting context a lot more closely, um, so a lot more easily rather. Um, 
whereas the translator side of things, um, yeah, there are lots of ways that you can sort of, I would I want to say blag, bad translation or incompetent translation, you can get by. Um, interpreting is much harder to do that with. So yeah, definitely. Well, I, I do have other questions, but uh, Callum, it's uh, past your two o'clock. It's past our nine o'clock here. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. It's really uh, very, very eye-opening. And um, I would I would remind our listeners, if you are interested in more uh, translation seminars, please visit our website. And also uh, Dr. Walker uh, was... Uh, she, he provided us with some references, and uh, those can be uh, found on our Facebook page and also on our web website. Uh, so thank you very much for those uh, references that you provided. Um, I'm also, I'm happy to share my slides as well if anyone wants those, because on the very last page is the full list of references of everything I cited as well. So if anyone does want the slides, I'm happy to share. That would be great. We can add on, add, add it to the, uh, yeah. the pages you provided. And also this read, this uh, this talk uh, is being recorded, so uh, so this uh, the recording will be found can be found on our website too. Yeah. Well, thank you again uh, very much, Dr. Walker, and uh, good you. luck with thank your you invitation. Good luck with your new book, and uh, and everything else. And we're going to you uh, leave the side uh, in one minute. You know, I'm sure there will be uh, messages coming up uh, in the chat box for Dr. Walker. All right. Well, good night, everybody, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.